Why do you think we need a, a workshop on negotiation strategies and skills? Like if this was 20 years ago and we had an alumni function, A, we'd have about a quarter of the attendees, but would we be talking about negotiation strategies? Women are seen as weak and uh, incompetent in, in a traditional uh, world, and so it's strategies to uh, okay. on that bias. That makes sense, but I don't know that that perception has changed that much. <laughs> 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 a session like this necessary? Yes. Yes. Okay. I think culturally, um, we as women are taught not to be active or not to be seen as being aggressive if you're asking for what you want. Yeah. So um, I think it's culture. Okay. And yes. And what I think why a negotiation workshop is so necessary is because of this. Yeah. For every dollar that a man makes, we bring home 75 cents. And that is assuming that we are in the same industry doing the same job. And there are several theories about why there's a gap in salary. Ms. Sandberg has invited us to lean in. Oh, always <laughs> jumps there. <laughs> has invited us to lean in, and that's great. But I think that in understanding why there's a gap, we need to first be able to diagnose the problem. And to the extent that some of it is cultural, and that's very true, but there are some things that as women, we can do to close that gap. Because socially and culturally, yes, it is very tough. Just yesterday I was reading in the New York Times about Ms. Obama's trip to Asia. Now, I can't tell you any of the topics that she was going to talk about, but you know what I can't tell you? She wore a 50s style dress and the five photographs of all the dresses that she's been wearing lately. So she's kind of going away from a girly style. So yeah, I am. it is clear that there are a lot of social and cultural messages out there that support there being a difference in pay. There's a newscaster who wore the same mail, wore the same suit for an entire year on television and no one noticed. Wore the same suit every day for a year. There you go. No one noticed. <laughs> you mean a, a male newscaster? A male oh, newscaster. Okay. newscaster. Yeah. But the real goal here is to focus on strategies and approaches that we can use right here, right now, to close that gap. And eventually really change those cultural and social messages that make us focus more on outfits than substance. So, to do that, we're going to kind of look at some of the gender influences that affect negotiation. And we're going to talk about the linguistic differences in the way that men and women talk. Now, what I'd like for you to do is there, everyone has cell phones. Oh, I know you do. <laughs> The first group had a lot of difficulty doing this. You guys look very like possessed. I'm confident that we will do even better. <laughs> I'd like you to turn it on video, having it face you, and then for two minutes, I want you to explain your biggest business or workplace accomplishments. Two minutes. And if you haven't yet entered into the workforce, your academic or your your biggest accomplishments. Two minutes. Go for it. Yep. All right. Just start talking. I will keep my Thank you.
Because this gives a lot of insight into how we describe who we are and what we do. The idea of talking about your accomplishments for two minutes, and I only want a minute and 40 seconds, is tough. It can make you uncomfortable. I saw people playing with their hair. I saw people laughing. I saw people looking away. When I give the same exercise to men, choice that you used. I hope that the only pronouns that were being used were I pronouns, not we. Were you taking ownership? Were you defining your accomplishments in quantifiable terms? Were you uncomfortable doing so? I bet that if I had called Deborah, you know, my boyfriend dumped me, um, you could have spoken for five to ten minutes, no problem, in how to make me feel better and explaining your own experiences. But talking about our accomplishments in a way that we are our own advocate is very difficult. And kind of culturally, some of the odds are stacked up against us. Um, how we say what we say, the importance of linguistics, notes general categories of differences between males and females. Now, I feel the need to get out my like five second disclaimer. This is not saying that each and every female speaks this way. To the some extent, I'm going to use the shorthand of some stereotypes or generalizations. So, if you are the alpha female and you are, this is not you at all, the research, this research doesn't apply to you. But these are some general observations. And in looking at linguistics, we will see that there's a difference in the sexes between directness and wordiness, word choice, the pace, at which we speak, our senses of humor, figures of speech, the stories that we use, my favorite, questions and apologies. And men and women tend to use these differently. And our cues for, or the reasons why we do this starts very young. Um, I have boy-girl twins. And if you had told me prior to becoming a mom that there's a difference in the genders, Baloney, it's not true. They don't have a chance. From the age of like two on, society very much pushes you in the way that you go. My daughter comes, and first, try to find something for your daughter to wear that's not pink or purple and bedazzled. <laughs> Where, Where little boys, boys have shirts with truck signs, soccer, soccer balls. balls. Increasingly exactly. difficult to find. But, but what you really, really happens is, Oh, Judy, how are you? You look so pretty. Oh. <laughs> I'm an adult for you. Where's your son? Are you playing sports yet? Are you going to be on the soccer team? What are you going to be when you grow up? And it starts down here. And we get really good at those messages really early on. 
But we take that and let's build on that. We learn to build rapport and confer status. These are kind of the two operating approaches that really shape our communication styles. Now for girls, we build rapport by, by emphasizing similarities, similarities, gaining closeness, we always have a BFF. <laughs> Downplay our superiority and balance our needs. And just in listening before the session starts, someone has really cute shoes. Oh, I love your shoes, they are so cute. <laughs> <laughs> and they are cute. But anyway, we confer status by talking to each other of, I don't want to seem smarter, better. We're all close, we're all friends. I don't need to stick out. Boys, on the other hand, kick at the hill, grabbing someone, giving them a nuggy. Mr. Know-it-all, very different. And we take these language skills, these approaches to rapport with us into the workplace. But unfortunately, when you hang out with your girlfriends, all the rules are the same. When you turn to the workplace, the best I can say is the rules are the same, but they're guy rules. Now, certain industries that's changing some, Healthcare, to the extent that I have seen a cultural change, I think it's more so in healthcare than in other areas like law or finance. But the rules of the game, for the most part, have been shaped more by a male interaction than a female. So when I go with my, oh, I'm sorry, I'm late. I'm sorry, can I ask a question? That in a male-dominated environment takes on different interpretations than when I say it in a room full of women here. So, yes. do we need to develop an androgynous language? I mean, is that, I think men are pretty aware, more and more aware of, of what's coming down the pipeline, which is that this you know, tsunami of women leaders and, and uh, executive work. But, so, uh, considering these gender differences, what you're talking about, but you know, just a, a, a new language, a new language. But, uh, yeah, I mean, that well, comes at, to my mind. I, has I would things, push back but, a little. Mm -hmm. I don't feel that I should be stripped of the way that I communicate. Right, right. So, it requires understand. me to, because you were taught early on, know the rules of the game and play the rules of the game appropriately, mm -hmm. which was the guy way. I don't know that the evolution that I want to step into is now no one gets to be who they are. You know what? I like your shoes, and I want to be able to say those are really cute shoes and still be taken seriously. Right. Yes? Then don't we have the double-edged sword where if we play by the guy rules, now we're bossy, because we're not yeah, assertive yeah. we're bossy, she or we're mean, she or we're, you know. It is incredibly difficult, and it's not just that. It is when you don't engage in behavior that they expect women should engage in, you get dinged. Yes. You get like dinged by women. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. We're equal oh, opportunity gosh. there. Yes, right. <laughs> <laughs> Case in point, one of the faculty members had a baby, and she brought the baby into the office. No one expects men to go out into the hallway and say, oh, the baby's so cute. I stayed in my office. I have twins. I see kids all. <laughs> <laughs> Did I not hear? You didn't go when you don't, so acting like a guy or not acting in a way that a woman is supposed to act is difficult. So there are several landmines out there and I don't know that our time is best spent talking about all those landmines. What I want to focus on is how do we avoid them? How do we uncover, how do we blow them off? How do we remove them from our path? So, um, in terms of after the session, take a look at your baseline video of yourself as ways to detect elements of your linguistic styles. And to the extent, do these styles accompany you in the workplace? And if they do, are they serving you as well as they should? So, some of the common differences. Men have a tendency to use I statements a lot. Women have a tendency to use more of the plural pronouns. And how this can be harmful, and this is industry specific. There are some industries that are incredibly team oriented. 
and interjecting an I statement could be seen as a problem. However, there is still a responsibility so that your accomplishments, and whether that be a one-on-one -on -one conversation with your boss, making sure that you have volunteered for the opportunity or the new assignment so your name is associated with it, whether it be attachments of pronouns or not, you need to make sure that you have distinguished yourself from the team. Because what happens is, I think of Vanessa's team as, wow, team five is really great. Yeah. If you're Victor now. Victor has been saying, I did this, I did this, I did this. When I'm looking for a leader, I'm not going to pick team five. The name Victor is going to come to mind. When they are thinking about leaders within your team, is your name the one that comes to mind? And if not, how can you change that either through clearly defining what you do or in your performance appraisal or your evaluation, making sure that your contributions are quantifiable and are displayed. And when I say quantifiable, people will love to say, you know, I'm a real team-oriented person, I'm really productive, I think outside the box. I don't know what those words mean. Because everyone says the same words. If you're effective, show me in hardcore, with hardcore data, how are you effective? I like to consider myself a good teacher. Well, okay, so is my second grade teacher. However, by the changes that I made in the curriculum, when I look at student assessments on reading comprehension or on internalization of the core concepts, the grades went from a class average of 72 to 84. That's quantifiable. Can you talk about your skills in that way? When you look at your CV, do you have stories for all the jobs and the positions and the traits that you have? Think outside the box. Everyone and their mother thinks outside the box. <laughs> Give me some examples of how you think outside the box. And have it so that it's not how, why should the organization care? How do those three examples benefit the organization? So that's important. Apologies. Men generally never apologize. Women apologize to inanimate objects. During the break, I literally, a woman box, oh, I'm sorry. I'm like, it's a table. <laughs> They don't need to apologize for everything. People who are serial apologizers, or there's probably a better word for that, appear less confident, more blameworthy. If I know that you apologize for everything, I'm more inclined to, yeah, you did it. Listen, words very much matter. Listen to the words coming out of your mouth. And it's not just, I'm sorry, because this just really neuters and downplays everything that you say. But it's all those horrible clauses that come before some a woman's main point that I want to lop off. Um, I'm sorry, you know, I was kind of thinking that, no, you have a real point. Lop off all that other crap. Or I think that, no, you don't think that. You just know. Get to your point. So when you listen to the scenarios that you guys were saying, were you owning your statements? Or was there a prefect of proceedings that watered down the point that you were ultimately making? And not just that, what is your body language saying while you're saying it? And so much, even, and the intonation. I love in salary. So, uh, is it thy? Davia? Um, so, what would you like to make? Uh, 50000 I'm sorry, was it a question? No. <laughs> it comes out as a question, the intonation. Or what generally happens, I, I was looking at uh, 50000 No, I'm worth $50,000. Sorry. And then you know what's going to happen? Then I'm going to sit there as the employer. I'm just going to sit there for a second, and I'm going to wait, because five, four, I mean, I mean, fifty thousand is a lot, but I mean, I, I can take like <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, five or um, I mean, or like <laughs> fifty, but then you can take away a week's vacation. Yeah. yeah. Sure. I love the monologue because it's all working in my favor. Keep running with that. When you ask for things, whether it be salary, whether it be whatever it is, ask for it and then shut up. 
There is nothing that comes after that period that is helping your cause. So you know what? I want to work from, no. I would like to work from home on Fridays. And that's all you need. But turn your camera around, just like you do to see if your outfit looks good, and own it. Which, and I, I practice the I'm waiting confidently face. It's the, I want to work from home on Fridays. Maintain eye contact, no hair twirling. <laughs> and own it. And we have a reluctance to do that. And unfortunately, men and women are both equally hard on women. And I don't know if you can be a sexist against yourself, but when a woman walks in, I'm like, all right. And psychologically, I'm like, all right, this should get a little bit easier. Which is a horrible thought. Come in, own it. All right. Tell me you don't work with dumb men. Come on now. Yeah, but. Spot them all the way. Yes. Um, I don't say it like that, but you know. Oh, I would. But, oh, but <laughs> as long as you edit that part out of the video. Um, we quickly size up the people. But I'm more inclined to, a woman has to bring it a little more. And that's something that I'm actively working on divesting myself of. Yes. Where do you draw that line between being a confident woman and then being a bitch? Yeah. A ton of this is who you are as a person and what you're willing to own. Now, there are some people that my personality just rubs them the wrong way. I'm okay with that. I also, however, you don't get to be 47 and do a number of jobs without figuring out what is going to work here? And that's just part of being smart. If I'm sitting next to someone and I have a person that gives like a lot of crap, if you respond, I can go down a certain ray. But if I'm with someone and I try to be funny and it's like, uh-huh, there are aspects of my personality that I'm going to have to decrease the volume on. However, what doesn't get taken out of the equation is me asking for what I want and for me making sure that I am acquiring uh, all the value that is possible out of that situation. Now, there are certain institutions, there are certain people where instead of this being an immediate ask, it may be a longer process. It may be, you know what, I am not going to be able to ask on my behalf. Who are the people on the sidelines that can ask? And it need, you need to be smart about it. Is there someone that is going to have more influence with this person? Pull more weight? And if so, who are they and how do I enlist their help? And that's just part of being a smart negotiator. Um, business norms are obviously framed more around the male approach. Healthcare, again, as I said, is somewhat different. Um, what's interesting is women have a tendency to ask questions to show engagement. I'm really interested in what you say and I let you know that I'm listening and I'm by asking a lot of follow-up questions. Careful how that can be perceived. I saw this when some residents were doing rounds, during ground rounds, and there was one female who was just peppering person taking them around with questions. And from my point of view, she was really engaged, her questions were insightful, and it made a ton of sense. And yes, I was following them around in part for like stuff that I could use in class. And there was a guy there who said not a word and just kind of stood back. And in my mind, I was like, you're hungover and you don't have a darn thing to offer. Nevertheless, at the end, I asked the person who was taking them around to rate in terms of confidence and mastery of what was going on, the students or the residents. The woman came out at the bottom and I asked why. Did you hear all those questions? Careful how it is interpreted. Because things that we show for engagement aren't always perceived that way. And little things, it's just odd. Uh, there was a business meeting and a woman, which I saw and knew what it was, she's sitting under the table and she's pushing her cuticles back. <laughs> Whatever. 
<laughs> At the break, guys, like, did you see how nervous that woman was? Oh. I was like, oh, dude, she needs to get a manicure. She is not nervous. <laughs> <laughs> Things that we are projecting one way can be perceived another way. So just be mindful of what's going on. Women have a tendency to underestimate their own worth, be very rules conscious, take disagreements that, uh, personally, be too, be too deferential, and I've already talked about underuse of silence. In terms of being rule oriented and deferential, in response to an ask, if a woman is told, I'm sorry, there's no policy for that, or no, if I do it for you, then I'm gonna have to do it for everyone else, or it hop it's just not the Hopkins way. Okay, thanks. That's not the end of the story. Push. And you need to push in a way that's consistent with your personality. And I'd like to say, I would love to be able to stand here and tell you that my efforts to get a higher salary have been wonderfully successful. No, I am like Sisyphus, and this is my rock, because I do it every year with the same, about the same results every year. But it doesn't stop me from trying. Um, but to the extent that if I do it for you, I'll have to do it for everyone. I'm not asking that you do it for everyone. Push. Now, the shaking of the head. No, because we wouldn't do it. No, the organization wouldn't. No. Because I, I have thought exactly the And guess what? You're exceptional. <laughs> and when we go into negotiations, so often, the mindset is, all right, um, I love this job and I've done my budget. If, if they hire me and they pay me $25,000, I'm gold. I, I can pay my bills and get out of my parents' basement. Now, ideally, I'd like to make 40, but um, just, just get the job. And when you go in with that mindset, do you know what you end up with? You end up getting the job for the twenty-five thousand. You need to walk into that interview with the this forty thousand dollar job is mine. Because where you negotiate from, where you mentally anchor yourself, is the point from which you negotiate. So what I mean by that is, let's take something like a car. I would love to get this car for eight thousand dollars. But yeah, I can pay up to 12. If I go and thinking, all right, let me just anything around 12, I'll be happy with. If that is where I've anchored myself, that is where I'm going to end up. Whereas if I walk in going, I'm getting this car for $8,000. That is where I'm going to negotiate from. And for asks, whether it be employment, anything else, you have the aspiration on what you absolutely have to need before you take another course of action. Negotiate from the aspiration. All right, uh, and everything is negotiable. And I think that that is one of the, everything, and I do mean everything. Do not go to Home Depot with me. Everything in Home Depot is negotiable. And while you say, if I'm a veteran or if I'm over 65, you get a 5% discount at Home Depot or Lowe's. So for any merchandise in the store, they are prepared for certain categories of people to give it to them for 5% less. Okay, so I'm not a veteran and I'm not 65 yet. However, there is flexibility in all of those prices. And I believe I am entitled to that. So I ask. Yeah. And cashier? It all, <laughs> cashier. Yeah. Asking the cashier is like negotiating with HR, which I will get to in a second. <laughs> Waste of time. Yeah. Um, it depends on what the product is. If it's, and I annoyed my us because I spent half an hour. And it depends on how much you enjoy. I like negotiating. <laughs> so spending a half an hour negotiating over a $5.99 bag of nails is an afternoon well spent for me. <laughs> <laughs> he will not go with me to Home Depot anymore. Um, but you asked a really good question. Find out who makes the decisions. Don't waste time. Don't be in that used car salesman situation where I've spent three hours on the floor with a salesman who gets me right up to that price. Oh, I have my have to ask my manager. In comes the manager and takes back all that value. Oh, I'm sorry if you don't do that. 
don't waste your time. So, in Home Depot, it's the manager. Now, people on the floor can give a discount up to like one or two percent if there's like a thing in it or something missing. But if you're going for the full five, <laughs> pull in the manager. Also works at Nordstrom's with shoes. Salespeople get commissions. I'm just saying, cute shoes can be yours. <laughs> anyway, um, I did have a bigger point, HR. For the job offers, first of all, in a job situation, if you're in the situation where they ask you what the range is that you're looking for, never give a range because you always end up at the bottom end of that range. When you actually are, and I always say, offer a number that, and you do your homework, you need to know what is reasonable for the skills that you bring, for what they are looking for, and use your network. I have called and I've been called to ask. And salaries are, from the perspective of an employer, it's amazing how we limit our power. Employees, <coughs> for some reason, how much you make is like your weight. No one wants to talk about it. By you not talking about it, as the employer, I'm quite happy that I was able to pay Catherine five thousand dollars less than you. And because you two are never going to talk, I don't have to worry about it. Have that conversation. I've offered up and asked what other people have been making. I recommend that you know them relatively well, <laughs> so you can trust what they're saying. But I've also, had, you know, I'm interviewing for a job. What, was, what did you negotiate? That is power that is available out there that is yours to utilize. But when you're given that offer, and people are very nervous about asking for more, what if they take the offer away? Other than that, like one or two stories that you hear on the internet, I've spent a fair amount of time interviewing candidates. I've gone through a host of CVs, and for whatever reason, I believe that you have what our organization needs. So I'm sitting down with you. I'm invested. So I've made you an offer. I'm very excited about the possibility of working here. I'd like some time to think about it. Never accept, to the extent possible, an offer over the phone or through a letter. Call up. I've had an opportunity to think about it. I'm, I have a few questions. Could I come in? Could we grab a cup of coffee? Come in. Now, it is incredibly easy to say no in a letter. It's like a Dear John letter. No, you suck. I'm not giving you anything. Hit send. It's easy to say no over the phone. When telemark, no, I don't want it. Click. It is incredibly hard to say no when someone is sitting directly across from you, unless you're HR. You're not working with HR. Now, if you're working with HR, then have your conversation with them. But you're not working with HR. They are not vested in you coming to the organization. Vanessa, I've sat down with you. I want you to join our team. And if you ask me for $5,000 more, I am not going to run the risk of you walking out, generally speaking, because of $5,000. I'd like you. I have, and you've used the language of, in our conversations of already placing yourself in the organization to use inclusive language, stuff like that. So I'm already envisioning you there. 5,000 is not going to make you walk away. Yes, and then I thought, do you have a question? Oh, yes. Um, I actually had a, a situation where I was, when I was younger, like you know, eight years ago, and um, I found out that my salary was a capital or a great amount of what I'm, I was um, supposed to come in at. And another employee who came in after me was given the higher rate. And so when I found out that that was the case, I, you know, I, I demanded the change. Now, the, I got the change eventually through um, putting it on paper, but that, that ended up getting pushed back, and I never got a raise after that, and it ended up getting pushed out. So I, I was like almost like blacklisted as a person who was like, yeah, she's more than assertive, but she was like pushing buttons, and I, I got my salary and the back pay. I felt really good about it. I tapped myself on the shoulder for sacrificing my salary, but then it made me feel down the line that I shouldn't, um, get a salary increase, and instead I might have to leave the job if I want a salary increase because I've already experienced the pushback of people challenging you for what you really deserve, you know, and some more. But um, I just found that this negative, negative, negative experience left me feel like a sore spot. 
Okay. So, yes, excellent. Fit is very important. Do you want to be in an organization where they feel that you challenging their right to underpay you yeah. is a problem? I'm going to treat you poorly and, wait, you're going to complain about that? All right, I'll give you legally what I'm required to, but no, you got to go. Probably not, ultimately, the organization that is right for you. So think mindfully. Generally speaking, you spend more time at work than anywhere else. You need to be properly paid. Or what is a value to you needs to be met. Now, obviously, Making a ton of money is not important to me because I no longer practice law and I'm a professor at Hopkins. And Hopkins is what it is. But for me, the idea of teaching at one of the best institutions in the world is incredibly important to me. So for me, for my value set, that interest trumps salary. So you need to be clear on what is important to you. So what are some strategies? <clears throat> How am I doing on time? I feel like, ooh, let me talk really, really fast. Um, you need to have a list of what it is that you want out of your job now and in five years. And you always, and that, what you want means hard and soft interests. And when you are asked to do something, you need to pull something off that list. What do I mean by that? At Hopkins, we have a policy that you don't get a new, you get a new computer as a faculty every two years, or no, every three years. As I mentioned, I have eight-year-old monsters. Uh, one of my kids thought it was a really cool idea to take all her 10 different colors of nail polish and paint my keyboard. Oh my god. <laughs> uh, did not go well, because when you use a uh, nail polish remover, it actually takes the letters off with it. <laughs> and I'm not that good a typist. So I was asked to do an online program for the school, and I was like, yes, and to do that, I need a brand new, brand new laptop, HD mic, uh, camera. I need a big screen. What is it that you need to do to get your, to get where you want to be? I have very little power, Hopkins. God knows I'm not tenured, but I know what I like. And when I'm asked to do something, how can I leverage those that ask against what I need? So you have two options in situations like that. Yes, and, or no, unless. So no, I can't do the online program unless I have these resources. And if you don't have a clear idea of what it is, the things that you need to insert in those key conversations, you leave value for yourself on the table. I am moving faster now. All right, so negotiate for small and large wins. And if you get shut down in the present, oh, I'm sorry, we have no money in the budget for a race, which has been the reoccurring like conversation for the past six years. If I achieve X objectives, can we revisit my salary in six months? Or not take out, can we? I would like to revisit my salary X. Follow it up with an email, but have them identify what it is that they need to give you what you want. Obviously, don't downplay your strengths or emphasize your weaknesses. Do not. The worst time to ask for anything is right after you've accomplished something. What do I mean by that? I would really like a research assistant. Carrie expects me to do this online program. So you know what? I'm just going to buckle down. I'm going to do a fantastic job on the online healthcare course. And then once it launches, once everything's good, I'm going to ask for my research assistant. Guess what I just proved to them? That I can do it without the research assistant. When they ask you to do something, then is when you ask. Dorothy, this isn't Kansas anymore, and just doing a great job and waiting to be rewarded with all the other noise that surrounds the workplace probably won't happen. Ask. Also, make sure that uh, there are things that you can ask for at Hopkins. Um, negotiating for money, you can run into a lot of trouble. But you can also ask for persuasive introductions <coughs> or other things. What I learned when I entered academia is that, um, silly me, uh, I didn't know that 
being a, having a PhD is way, way better than having a JD. And when I joined the faculty, I was the only full-time JD. I was down here, and then you had the PhDs up there. So for me, it was important Let's negotiate a persuasive introduction. So I'm not just some person who shows up in an office. So the dean of faculty walked me around and introduced me to people. Hi, this is Stacy Lee, she's doing. And I set the stage for the way I wanted to be viewed. I could not have wrangled another $2,000 out of my, uh, my initial salary offer if I wanted. But having him plant the seed of, this is someone we're excited about, this is what she's going to do for us, was something he willingly gave up. I asked for it, but it helped set me or negotiate the way I wanted to be viewed within my organization. This your title, this your introduction, or the way that you're perceived, the way you want it to be, and if not, how can you enlist the help of others to change that? Um, assume everything is negotiable negotiable. Put yourself forward, actively pursue your professional goals. And again, just be really clear on what it is that you want. So, um, and this is just the Home Depot. Now, five steps to know the goal. What is unique about you? And again, that goes back to the stories from your CV. What makes you valuable to the organization? And always view it from their lens. I mean, your mom loves you just for you being you. But to the extent that I'm hiring you, I'm hiring you because I want you to make me look good. Your answers, the way you sell yourself, which we learned about early this morning, needs to be in that framework. What are their interests? There is no excuse for going to any job interview without pulling their annual report, their 10K. You need to know who they are, where they're going and just Google and use all the resources out there. That's just basic job finding 101. In terms of compensation package, there are millions of things that are negotiable. And as a follow-up, I have a two and a half page list that I'm going to give to the program director so they can send out to everyone of what are the things that you can or should look at in terms of what is negotiable. People get so focused on salary, but given where you are in your life, what's important to you? Are there things that are more important than salary? In the prior session, a woman talked about student loans. Can we somehow work that into the equation? I have kids that I want to be away from. So for me, traveling anywhere I can, just kidding. <laughs> know what you want to negotiate for. And this is just a list of things that should help jog your memory in terms of what are negotiable things that should be on the table. Now, the power of not asking. A man and a woman come in for a job, the offer is for $25,000, woman immediately accepts. The guy asks for $5,000 more and he gets it. They both receive 3% raises till the age of 60. That's their gap in salary. The male takes this surplus and invests it 3% over the 38 years of his career. At the end of the day, he has half a million dollars more. You have to ask. So to the extent that there's that huge salary gap, yeah, a lot of it is society. But at least a part of it is you can't get what you don't ask for. So you miss 100% of the shots that you don't take. Yay. I wonder, did I end on time? And if we have extra time, I'm more than happy to take any questions that are more specific to what you guys may be dealing with. Elena hasn't come to pull us out something. All right, so I think we're good for now. Yeah. Is there, is there a percentage? Like, if you are negotiating for a salary, is there mm -hmm. a percentage that we should be asking for? Um, You've said two or three thousand dollars, but to me, it is not worth it, right? It is your comfort level. Um, for me, and let's just, I know that let's say starting salaries for uh, business law professors at peer institutions, let's just say it's fifty thousand dollars of like peer institutions. Hopkins, I know, is going to offer me forty. I'm going to go and ask him for 
55. So you're going to do a parallel for Yes. Okay. But again, I really, really wanted to work at Hopkins. I stopped them. So was I as aggressive in my salary negotiations? No, because salary to me was taking a second to the prestige of working for Hopkins. So it's very dependent on what is important to you. But um, I would absolutely go find out what's the average in the industry. And I would always, you want to negotiate into the range that you want to be. So never start in that range because I'm just going to ratchet you down further. Yes? How would you recommend negotiating work life balance type of things, such as, you know, I want to be a mom in a couple of years? Mm -hmm. How do I negotiate? I want to have a flex work arrangement without being looked down upon, especially by, you know, if I'm in a high performing organization, how would that affect my performance? Yeah, that's a tough one. Um, and I'd love to say that things have changed so much that this will not be an issue for you. But I went from being a practicing attorney to being a professor to achieve a better work-life balance. Um, a lot of it is, and is it Apple or Google that's offering to freeze eggs? I'm not a big fan on that. So let's figure out. Um, they are. Uh, but you can postpone it. Um, a lot, and a tough thing is, in, some, in many regards, negotiating with a female could in fact be harder. Um, but knowing your organization, and in, in some instances, you may have to change career paths. And that's just a reality that is one of the options that are that's out there. I think that it is changing. A lot of it is the amount of credibility that you have built up. So much in the same way that I tell students when they start their MBA program, I was like, look at the curriculum. You find three classes that, given your skill set, you're going to be really good at. And in those three classes, the professor better know your name. Because you're going to need letters of recommendation. You're going to need references. So you identify three people, and for lack of a better term, suck up to them. And it helps if you can get an A in the course while you're in the program. In this case, you need to build up your credibility such that when you have your ask, you can draw on that credibility. So if I know that you get work done, I'm going to be okay with letting you telecommute. But I also want to know how that is going to help me. So can we give you a cubicle then? And you'll give up your office so I can give it to someone else? Can you? How does the organization benefit from that? Always has to be the lens through which your asks are funneled. How is the organization going to benefit from me giving you whatever you want? But it first, finding out what type of balance makes sense for you. Are you going to delegate out portions of your life? Daycare, school plays, stuff like that, cooking. So figuring all of that out really goes into finding out what mix makes the most sense for you. So would you say uh, cleavage is out and muscles and legs are in? I work with what I have. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, a lot of this is all about knowing what you have to bring to the table. So would I wear a shirt down? No, nah, it just doesn't work for me. This does. <laughs> yes. <laughs> How do you bypass the um, behavior process? Which I put you into when they're trying to say, like, if you want to take a couple of days off and you can have time for your kids to telework, mm -hmm. and then you know the benefits that you came into an in interview, but then you always have an interview process for the business where they want to trickle you through this process before <coughs> they introduce you to the benefits you already know you have, mm -hmm. and you can really, um, you can really um, find yourself playing the game is not even introduced to you yet because you're still in the interview process. Maybe six months in, and you're you're actually into the playing the game, but by that time. You're exhausted and trying to figure out whether it's the point of staying because I have to do all this is to get to the normal place and there's no point. Well, you, and you've got to be mindful. You go for the long game and the short game. So the hazing process, I went to West Point. First whole year being a plea is nothing but a hazing process. You keep your eye on, do I want to graduate? Is this that important to me? Is this, is this a MIC job or is this the job? And if it's the job, sometimes you just and this comes out real, just gotta take your lumps. <laughs>